Assalamualaikum dan salam sejahtera Bertemu kita di dalam kuliah online Bagi subjek Vibration Analysis and Monitoring okay, Saya Muhammad Irman Beramli dengan ini akan menerangkan tentang intipati untuk lecture kita yang kelima Secara online Okay, baik, uh, bagi lecture yang kelima ini, kita akan masuk kepada tajuk yang berkaitan dengan pemprosesan isyarat ataupun signal processing. Sebelum kita pergi uh, lebih jauh, jadi di sini saya terangkan tentang maksud signal ataupun isyarat. Baik, dinyatakan bahawa a signal is a function of an independent variable such, such as time, Distance, position or temperature Dekat sini kita faham Misalnya signal atau isyarat itu Adalah satu fungsi Daripada pemboleh ubah bebas uh, Yang juga termasuk dalamnya uh, uh, Sebagai contoh Seperti masa, jarak Kedudukan ataupun suhu Dan signal Ataupun isyarat tersebut Dikatakan bersambungan Ataupun berkesinambungan Apabila domainnya adalah satu set nombor nombor yang benar ataupun real number ataupun discrete dan sebaliknya jadi dia adalah sifatnya adalah berterusan okey apabila domainnya itu adalah terdiri daripada real number dan juga discrete number okey <tuh> seterusnya signal ataupun discrete signal dipersembahkan sebagai satu turutan nombor yang dipanggil sebagai sampel dan di sini ada dua jenis signal iaitu analog dan juga digital kedua-dua jenis signal ini saling memerlukan di antara satu sama lain jikalau dahulu teknologi dahulu dia lebih kepada menggunakan analog signal tetapi dengan peredaran zaman teknologi menggunakan banyak menggunakan digital signal kerana digital signal ni lebih menjimatkan masa dan juga menjimatkan kos dan dia lebih um, menghasilkan satu keputusan yang lebih baik jika dibandingkan dengan analog signal Okey. Gambar rajah ini menunjukkan uh, continuous signal ke okay, atas semua dalam bentuk uh, sine wave. Seterusnya discrete signal yang bawah ni dan akhir sekali digital signal. Di mana kalau kita faham daripada yang di atas ni diberitahu bahawa analog signal ni adalah real value continuous signal. Sebenarnya Gabungan antara continuous signal, discrete signal menghasilkan digital signal yang di bawah ni. Okay, yang di bawah ni. Ceritanya, digital signal takkan ada jikalau tidak wujudnya analog signal yang dikatakan dalam bentuk continuous dan diubah bentuk kepada discrete dan akhirnya menjadi digital. Jadi, ada terutanya continuous signal yang sebelumnya kita katakan sebagai analog signal diubah bentuk menjadi discrete signal dan akhirnya menjadi digital signal ok uh, seterusnya bila kita mengatakan tentang signal processing dia kegunaannya adalah mainly ataupun uh, kebiasaannya untuk membuat um, signal generation signal generation maknanya menghasilkan signal Ataupun uh, untuk mendapatkan macam mana signal itu dihasilkan Mendapatkan maklumat macam mana signal itu dihasilkan Seterusnya Macam mana nak modify signal tersebut Dan akhir sekali How to extract information from signal Macam mana nak dapatkan maklumat daripada signal Yang dipolehi Jadi <coughs> Signal processing ini uh, Jikalau uh, kita dapat me master ya master ataupun kita dapat 
menggunakannya secara uh, baik jadi kita dapat faedah daripadanya seperti macam mana kita nak improve uh, apa-apa teknologi dalam uh, bidang kejuruteraan elektrik gunaan uh, matematik gunaan statistik teknologi maklumat matematik sebenarnya mekanikal bidang kejuruteraan mekanikal perubatan dan pelbagai lagi bermakna signal processing ni amat banyak faedah yang dapat kita perlui jikalau kita dapat menguasai menguasai bagaimana untuk nak buat signal generation nak buat signal modifying ataupun signal modification dan seterusnya dari situ kita dapat uh, maklumat daripada signal tersebut iaitu kita extract maklumat dari uh, signal tersebut untuk kita mengetahui apa yang menyebabkan berlakunya sesuatu uh, isyarat tersebut ok baiklah yang ni definisi frekuensi saya rasa semua tahu uh, frekuensi itu seperti dia adalah uh, macam uh, memberitahu tentang berapa kali uh, kejadian tersebut berlaku uh, dalam satu masa yang, tetap, yang telah ditentukan ataupun Kekerapan dia dalam satu second, dalam satu saat. Okey, unit dia adalah hertz, uh, iaitu satu hertz sama dengan satu per saat. Okey, ini sebelum ni masa kita belajar di peringkat uh, menengah, kita selalu jumpa uh, unit hertz ini, iaitu yang berkaitan dengan frekuensi. Jadi uh, sebenarnya kalau kita nak mendapatkan uh, satu kaedah sampling okay, Sebelum kita nak buat satu signal mod, uh, modification ataupun signal generation Kita kena buat satu sampling Jadi uh, cara dia ataupun sampling tersebut dipanggil uh, menukar uh, signal continuous ataupun signal yang berterusan ni kepada discrete uh, Jadi kalau kita faham continuous ini adalah analog Bermakna, untuk nak mendapatkan signal ataupun digital signal, dia bermula daripada sifat dia dalam keadaan continuous signal, iaitu analog signal. Okay. Discrete ni menyatakan dia dah diubah kepada digital. Baik. So, uh, untuk ratio sampling ataupun kadar uh, persampelan, jadi dia biasanya digunakan... Uh, Simbol F Iaitu Number of sample Per second Collected from A continuous signal Jadi uh, Unit dia dalam Hertz lah Seperti yang dibincangkan tadi Hertz <coughs> Ok Contoh Consider the human hearing sense The human hearing range Is about from 20 Hertz To 20 kilohertz Jadi Sampling frequency Of audio signal Okay, bila berkaitan dengan hearing ni kita kaitkan dengan audio jadi dia mesti paling kurang 40 kHz untuk memasukkan ke semua audio signal yang boleh didengar oleh manusia iaitu antara 20 Hz hingga 20 kHz jadi at least 40 kHz maknanya dia telah masuk dalam domain tersebut Uh, contoh, uh, untuk pendengaran manusia, uh, bagi audio, audio yang dapat dikeluarkan oleh compact disc, jadi dia menggunakan frekuensi 44.1 kHz. Malakali telefon 16 kHz. Bermakna, dalam julat ataupun dalam uh, domain 20 Hz hingga 20 kHz. Jadi uh, teknologi ini telah dibentuk sekian rupa supaya manusia dapat uh, mendengar audio daripada signal yang ditangkap di antara uh, 20 Hz hingga 20 kHz. Okey. Apa jadi jikalau audio signal tersebut bawah daripada 20 Hz? Bermakna manusia tak dapat mendengar. Mungkin uh, macam haiwan-haiwan seperti anjing ke dan sebagainya uh, 
uh, haiwan-haiwan ini mungkin boleh mendengar di bawah daripada hearing range, hearing range manusia. Mungkin anjing boleh dapat mendengar sehingga 10 Hz. Tapi jika uh, manusia, uh, hearing range manusia dah sampai ke tahap itu. Jadi paling minimum 20 Hz hingga 20 kilo Hz. Kalau lebih, lebih baik. Okey. Kalau mana bunyinya akan lebih bising lah. Signal tu akan dapat lebih jelas dan sebagainya. Seterusnya untuk signal processing domain. <coughs> signal I usually study in. Okay, biasanya signal ni ataupun isyarat ni biasanya dalam tiga perkara ataupun tiga uh, domain. Iaitu time domain, frequency domain dan gabungan time and frequency domain. Secara serentak. Okay. Dan dia menggunakan time frequency representation. Okay. Dalam hal ini untuk mendapatkan uh, um, ataupun untuk mendap untuk mengubah signal daripada time domain kepada frekuensi domain dan juga sebaliknya digunakan satu kaedah yang dipanggil Fourier transform. Okay. Fourier transform ini penting uh, sebenarnya dia banyak kaedah uh, matematik lah. Jadi kita tidaklah sampai ke tahap untuk nak mengkaji apa itu Fourier Transform. Cuma nak bagi tahu Fourier Transform adalah um, satu kaedah method yang digunakan untuk mengubah isyarat ataupun signal daripada time domain ke frequency domain dan juga sebaliknya. Dalam hal itu, dalam hal ini uh, untuk Uh, transform signal tadi ke dalam macam contoh bentuk daripada time domain ke frequency domain sebaliknya uh, diubah lagi diangkat lagi Fourier transform itu kepada fast Fourier transform jadi dia lebih mantap kaedah ini kalau menggunakan kaedah fast Fourier transform yang lebih di upgrade berbanding dengan Fourier transform yang secara basic jadi fast Fourier transform ni uh, diperlukan Uh, untuk membuat signal processing fast multiplication of large integer solving partial differential equation magnetic resonance imaging jadi semua ini berkaitan dengan bidang-bidang uh, dalam bidang elektrik uh, dalam uh, mechanical dalam biotechnology dalam perubatan dan sebagainya jadi kesemua teknologi tersebut dia di belakangnya ada fast Fourier transform yang bertindak sebagai algorithm untuk membuat signal processing. Okey, untuk me memproses signal. Okey, method fast Fourier transform ataupun algorithm fast Fourier transform. Manakala untuk discrete Fourier transform, uh, dia 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 sebenarnya dia adalah menekankan kepada macam mana dia uh, represent digital time domain signal. Maknanya dia fokus pula kepada digital. Kalau fast Fourier transform ni dia boleh cover dua, -dua sekali analog dan juga uh, digital. Discrete ni dia fokus kepada digital. Okey, manakala inverse discrete Fourier transform pula adalah dia terbalik. Okey. Uh, untuk nak uh, mendapatkan uh, time domain representation jadi daripada frekuensi domain signal yang dia dapat tu dia akan uh, boleh dapat tahu time domain signal pula macam mana jadi dia menggunakan kaedah inverse discrete Fourier transform ok Okay, ini cara-cara macam mana nak buat uh, penentuan magnitude dan juga fasa-fasa untuk spectral spectrum tertentu. Jadi ini biasanya kalau kita buat uh, uh, dalam uh, makmal, uji kaji dan sebagainya, kita akan jumpa kaedah-kaedah ini. Okay. Okay, yang ni. Magnitude and phase spectrum of normal ECG. ECG tu tahu apa? Yang biasa dalam kajian untuk uh, mendapatkan degupan nadi ataupun degupan jantung pesakit. 
Jadi ha, ini tadi yang uh, digunakan untuk nak uh, apa signal processing ni di dalam bidang perubatan. Okey, yang ini menunjukkan normal ECG ni maknanya ada untuk manusia yang normal, degupan jantung dia sepatutnya uh, amplitude dia di antara 0 hingga negatif 2. Okey. Dia punya degupan dia. Dan time dia antara 0 hingga 1. Jadi ada dua degupan yang amplitude dia adalah uh, negatif 2. Okey. Uh, maknanya benda ni dia menunjukkan bahawa manusia yang uh, ECG ni saya boleh cari lepas ni apa maksud ECG dia. Okey. Uh, dia dalam uh, kajian untuk nak mengenal pasti uh, degupan jantung manusia. Okay, saya nak bagi tahu dekat sini bermakna uh, penggunaan signal processing ni sehingga kepada melibatkan apa, penentuan isyarat daripada jantung manusia ataupun nadi, denyutan nadi. Boleh juga didapatkan dia punya isyarat ataupun signal tersebut untuk diproses, di, di, dinamakan ECG. ECG ada maksud dia ya. Okay. Boleh cari lepas ni. Masuk ACG. Uh, jadi dia akan tunjukkan dalam bentuk uh, spectrum uh, normal ACG. Seterusnya magnetic spectrum dan juga phase spectrum. Jadi ketiga-tiga ni biasanya akan tunjukkan dalam osiloskop di hospital lah. Okay, untuk uh, jurawat ataupun untuk doktor mengenal pasti uh, kekuatan uh, denyutan nadi seseorang pesakit tersebut. Okay. The resulting new signal is usually viewed as a modified or filtered version of one of the original signal convolution. Okay. Convolution ni pula adalah tentang macam mana untuk nak uh, apa nama mendapatkan signal yang baru yang dimodify okey yang difilter a uh, daripada uh, hasil kerja signal processing tadi jadi dia ada juga dia punya theorem dia panggil uh, convolution theorem dan dia adalah boleh juga di 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 dikira di secara uh, berkesan menggunakan Kaedah Fourier Transform Ok, kat sini kepentingan Fourier Transform Algorithm Di dalam Mengenal pasti uh, Ataupun Memproses signal Dalam kita memproses signal Jadi dia ada filter-filter Filter-filter ni perlu dia, uh, ada Untuk kita nak dapatkan betul-betul Hanya signal yang tertentu yang kita nakkan Maknanya dia boleh buang Signal yang tak diperlukan jadi ada banyak berbagai jenis filter iaitu uh, low pass filter, okay, high pass filter, band pass filters dan juga band stop filters. Okay. Dan seterusnya, okay, dalam kita membincangkan, membicarakan tentang signal processing, kita jangan lupa tentang Uh, ada satu lagi elemen yang dipanggil sebagai eigen vector dan juga eigen value. Okey. Dia adalah satu elemen eigen vector dan uh, elemen value dan eigen value ni merupakan elemen yang penting. Jadi untuk kita mengenal pasti uh, sistem mekanikal yang terdiri daripada fizik dan engineering, uh, sistem dalam circuit elektrik ataupun sistem ekologi. Um Sebenarnya eigen vector dan eigen value ni dia digunakan macam mana untuk kita buat analisis uh, perubahan dalam bentuk linear. Okey. Eigen bahasa daripada kata Jerman yang bermaksud uh, karakteristik ataupun proper proper ni adalah uh, perkataan baik. Karakteristik ni adalah karakter ataupun sifat, sifat yang baik. Sifat yang benar baik. Uh, dan juga uh, dia di apply ataupun digunakan dalam analisis untuk stability uh, bubble analysis dan sebagainya ok 
okey ha, di bawah ini dibicarakan tentang uh, asal usul bagaimana agen vector dan agen belu tu uh, di dapatkan okey jadi sebenarnya dia ada video yang lengkap tentang maksud Ataupun cara mendapatkan nilai agen vektor dan agen value. Okay. Cara ringkasnya, dia bermula daripada dua titik yang mana kita ingin memindahkan dua titik tersebut ke satu titik yang baru. Contoh dari B kepada AB. Dan dia berkait dengan penggunaan uh, pengiraan menggunakan matrix okay. dan sebagainya. Okay. Um, kalau ikut uh, perangan ni, uh, dia kata untuk nak mengubah kolom A okay, ataupun change uh, the column of A and drag B to B an agent vector jadi kita nak ubahkan G ni kepada AV jadi ada tiga perkara yang kita kena ambil kira iaitu pertama setiap poin dalam ataupun atas line yang sama adalah agent vector jadi setiap line tu dia ada agent space dia dan setiap agent space tu dia ada agent value yang mengikutinya jadi jikalau kita uh, meletakkan V ke atas agent space uh, dengan uh, agent value lambda kecil daripada satu, jadi AV tu adalah menghampiri kosong kosong kosong-kosong kat sini lah dan apabila lambda dia besar pada satu, dia lebih jauh dan tiga fakta yang ketiga adalah kedua-dua agent space depend bergantung kepada kolom di A, A ni yang ada A ni sebenarnya dia ada, ada adalah uh, hasil darab uh, matrix Okay, dan dia hanya uh, mengubah kedudukan di S1 tak apa, lepas ni ada video yang akan menerangkan tentang bagaimana agent vector dan agent value itu dapat dipolehi ok yang ni dia menunjukkan uh, uh, kenapa agent value atau agent vector itu baik uh, dia baik untuk apa jadi apabila kita Seterusnya mendarab uh, V by A secara berterusan Kita akan dapat sekuens ataupun turutan V, A, B, A, konsolid V dan sebagainya okay. Agent space dia akan menarik uh, turutan tersebut Dan agent value pula dia akan uh, begitu sama ada ia akan habis Ataupun berakhir dekat kosong-kosong ataupun lebih jauh Dan ini yang penting Therefore, eigen vectors or eigen values tell us about system that evolve step by step. Okay, penting dekat sini bermakna kegunaan eigen vector dan eigen value ni dari segi uh, signal dia menunjukkan uh, perubahan ataupun uh, dia memberi kita tahu tentang perubahan yang berlaku untuk sistem tersebut step by step. Jadi perangan dia saya akan tunjukkan dalam video ni. Eigenvectors and eigenvalues is one of those topics that a lot of students find particularly unintuitive. Questions like, why are we doing this, and what does this actually mean, are too often left just floating away in an unanswered sea of computations. And as I've put out the videos of the series, a lot of you have commented about looking forward to visualizing this topic in particular. I suspect that the reason for this is not so much that eigenthings are particularly complicated or poorly explained. In fact, it's comparatively straightforward, and I think most books do a fine job explaining it. 
The issue is that it only really makes sense if you have a solid visual understanding for many of the topics that precede it. Most important here is that you know how to think about matrices as linear transformations, but you also need to be comfortable with things like determinants, linear systems of equations, and change of basis. Confusion about eigenstuffs usually has more to do with a shaky foundation in one of these topics than it does with eigenvectors and eigenvalues themselves. To start, consider some linear transformation in two dimensions, like the one shown here. It moves the basis vector i hat to the coordinates 3, 0, and j hat to 1, 2. So it's represented with a matrix whose columns are 3, 0, and 1, 2. Focus in on what it does to one particular vector, and think about the span of that vector, the line passing through its origin and its tip. Most vectors are going to get knocked off their span during the transformation. I mean, it would seem pretty coincidental if the place where the vector landed also happened to be somewhere on that line. But some special vectors do remain on their own span, meaning the effect that the matrix has on such a vector is just to stretch it or squish it, like a scalar. For this specific example, the basis vector i hat is one such special vector. The span of i hat is the x-axis, and from the first column of the matrix, we can see that i hat moves over to three times itself, still on that x-axis. What's more, because of the way linear transformations work, any other vector on the x-axis is also just stretched by a factor of three, and hence remains on its own span. A slightly sneakier vector that remains on its own span during this transformation is negative one, one. It ends up getting stretched by a factor of two. And again, linearity is going to imply that any other vector on the diagonal line spanned by this guy is just going to get stretched out by a factor of two. And for this transformation, those are all the vectors with this special property of staying on their span. Those on the x-axis getting stretched out by a factor of three, and those on this diagonal line getting stretched by a factor of two. Any other vector is going to get rotated somewhat during the transformation, knocked off the line that it spans. As you might have guessed by now, these special vectors are called the eigenvectors of the transformation, and each eigenvector has associated with it what's called an eigenvalue, which is just the factor by which it's stretched or squished during the transformation. Of course, there's nothing special about stretching versus squishing, or the fact that these eigenvalues happen to be positive. In another example, you could have an eigenvector with eigenvalue negative one-half, meaning that the vector gets flipped and squished by a factor of one-half. But the important part here is that it stays on the line that it spans out without getting rotated off of it. For a glimpse of why this might be a useful thing to think about, consider some three-dimensional rotation. If you can find an eigenvector for that rotation, a vector that remains on its own span, what you have found is the axis of rotation. And it's much easier to think about a 3D rotation in terms of some axis of rotation and an angle by which it's rotating, rather than thinking about the full 3x3 three three matrix associated with that transformation. In this case, by the way, the corresponding eigenvalue would have to be one since rotations never stretch or squish anything, so the length of the vector would remain the same. This pattern shows up a lot in linear algebra. With any linear transformation described by a matrix, you could understand what it's doing by reading off the columns of this matrix as the landing spots for basis vectors. But often, a better way to get at the heart of what the linear transformation actually does, less dependent on your particular coordinate system, is to find the eigenvectors and eigenvalues. I won't cover the full details on methods for computing eigenvectors and eigenvalues here, but I'll try to give an overview of the computational ideas that are most important for a conceptual understanding. Symbolically, here's what the idea of an eigenvector looks like. A is the matrix representing some transformation, with V as the eigenvector, and lambda is a number namely the corresponding eigenvalue. What this expression is saying is that the matrix vector product, a times v, gives the same result as just scaling the eigenvector v by some value lambda. 
So finding the eigenvectors and their eigenvalues of a matrix A comes down to finding the values of V and lambda that make this expression true. It's a little awkward to work with at first because that left-hand side represents matrix vector multiplication, but the right-hand side here is scalar vector multiplication. So let's start by rewriting that right-hand side as some kind of matrix vector multiplication, using a matrix which has the effect of scaling any vector by a factor of lambda. The columns of such a matrix will represent what happens to each basis vector, and each basis vector is simply multiplied by lambda, so this matrix will have the number lambda down the diagonal, with zeros everywhere else. The common way to write this guy is to factor that lambda out, and write it as lambda times i, where i is the identity matrix with ones down the diagonal. With both sides looking like matrix vector multiplication, we can subtract off that right-hand side and factor out the v. So what we now have is a new matrix, a minus lambda times the identity, and we're looking for a vector v such that this new matrix, times v, gives the zero vector. Now, this will always be true if v itself is the zero vector, but that's boring. What we want is a non-zero eigenvector. And if you watch chapter 5 and 6, you'll know that the only way it's possible for the product of a matrix with a non-zero vector to become zero is if the transformation associated with that matrix squishes space into a lower dimension. And that squishification corresponds to a zero determinant for the matrix. To be concrete, let's say your matrix A has columns 2, 1, and 2, 3, and think about subtracting off a variable amount, lambda, from each diagonal entry. Now imagine tweaking lambda, turning a knob to change its value. As that value of lambda changes, the matrix itself changes, and so the determinant of the matrix changes. The goal here is to find a value of lambda that will make this determinant zero, meaning the tweaked transformation squishes space into a lower dimension. In this case, the sweet spot comes when lambda equals one. Of course, if we had chosen some other matrix, the eigenvalue might not necessarily be one. The sweet spot might be hit at some other value of lambda. So this is kind of a lot, but let's unravel what this is saying. When lambda equals one, the matrix A minus lambda times the identity squishes space onto a line. That means there's a non-zero vector v such that a minus lambda times the identity times v equals the zero vector. And remember, the reason we care about that is because it means a times v equals lambda times v. Which you can read off as saying that the vector v is an eigenvector of a, staying on its own span during the transformation a. In this example, the corresponding eigenvalue is 1, so v would actually just stay fixed in place. Pause and ponder if you need to make sure that that line of reasoning feels good. This is the kind of thing I mentioned in the introduction. If you didn't have a solid grasp of determinants, and why they relate to linear systems of equations having non-zero solutions, an expression like this would feel completely out of the blue. To see this in action, let's revisit the example from the start, with a matrix whose columns are 3, 0, and 1, 2. To find if a value lambda is an eigenvalue, subtract it from the diagonals of this matrix and compute the determinant. Doing this, we get a certain quadratic polynomial in lambda, 3 minus lambda times 2 minus lambda. Since lambda can only be an eigenvalue if this determinant happens to be zero, you can conclude that the only possible eigenvalues are lambda equals two and lambda equals three. To figure out what the eigenvectors are that actually have one of these eigenvalues, say lambda equals two, plug in that value of lambda to the matrix and then solve for which vectors this diagonally altered matrix sends to zero. If you computed this the way you would any other linear system, you'd see that the solutions are all the vectors on the diagonal line spanned by negative 1, 1. This corresponds to the fact that the unaltered matrix, 3, 0, 1, 2, has the effect of stretching all those vectors by a factor of 2. Now, a 2D transformation doesn't have to have eigenvectors. 
For example, consider a rotation by 90 degrees. This doesn't have any eigenvectors, since it rotates every vector off of its own spin. If you actually try computing the eigenvalues of a rotation like this, notice what happens. Its matrix has columns 0, 1, and negative 1, 0. Subtract off lambda from the diagonal elements, and look for when the determinant is 0. In this case, you get the polynomial lambda squared plus 1. The only roots of that polynomial are the imaginary numbers, i and negative i. The fact that there are no real number solutions indicates that there are no eigenvectors. Another pretty interesting example, worth holding in the back of your mind, is a shear. This fixes i-hat in place and moves j-hat 1 over, so its matrix has columns 1, 0 and 1, 1. All of the vectors on the x-axis are eigenvectors with eigenvalue 1, since they remain fixed in place. In fact, these are the only eigenvectors. When you subtract off lambda from the diagonals and compute the determinant, what you get is 1 minus lambda squared. And the only root of this expression is lambda equals 1. This lines up with what we see geometrically, that all of the eigenvectors have eigenvalue 1. Keep in mind though, it's also possible to have just one eigenvalue, but with more than just a line full of eigenvectors. A simple example is a matrix that scales everything by 2. The only eigenvalue is 2, but every vector in the plane gets to be an eigenvector with that eigenvalue. Now is another good time to pause and ponder some of this before I move on to the last topic. I want to finish off here with the idea of an eigenbasis, which relies heavily on ideas from the last video. Take a look at what happens if our basis vectors just so happen to be eigenvectors. For example, maybe i-hat is scaled by negative 1, and j-hat is scaled by 2. Writing their new coordinates as the columns of a matrix, notice that those scalar multiples, negative 1 and 2, which are the eigenvalues of i-hat and j-hat, sit on the diagonal of our matrix, and every other entry is a 0. Any time a matrix has zeros everywhere other than the diagonal, it's called, reasonably enough, a diagonal matrix. And the way to interpret this is that all the basis vectors are eigenvectors, with the diagonal entries of this matrix being their eigenvalues. There are a lot of things that make diagonal matrices much nicer to work with. One big one is that it's easier to compute what will happen if you multiply this matrix by itself a whole bunch of times. Since all one of these matrices does is scale each basis vector by some eigenvalue, applying that matrix many times, say 100 times, is just going to correspond to scaling each basis vector by the 100th power of the corresponding eigenvalue. In contrast, try computing the 100th power of a non-diagonal matrix. Really, try it for a moment. It's a nightmare. Of course, you'll rarely be so lucky as to have your basis vectors also be eigenvectors. But if your transformation has a lot of eigenvectors, like the one from the start of this video, enough so that you can choose a set that spans the full space, then you could change your coordinate system so that these eigenvectors are your basis vectors. I talked about change of basis last video, but I'll go through a super quick reminder here of how to express a transformation currently written in our coordinate system into a different system. Take the coordinates of the vectors that you want to use as a new basis, which in this case means our two eigenvectors, then make those coordinates the columns of a matrix, known as the change of basis matrix. When you sandwich the original transformation, putting the change of basis matrix on its right, and the inverse of the change of basis matrix on its left, the result will be a matrix representing that same transformation but from the perspective of the new basis vector's coordinate system. The whole point of doing this with eigenvectors is that this new matrix is guaranteed to be diagonal, with its corresponding eigenvalues down that diagonal. This is because it represents working in a coordinate system 
where what happens to the basis vectors is that they get scaled during the transformation. A set of basis vectors, which are also eigenvectors, is called, again reasonably enough, an eigenbasis. So if, for example, you needed to compute the 100th power of this matrix, it would be much easier to change to an eigenbasis, compute the 100th power in that system, then convert back to our standard system. You can't do this with all transformations. A shear, for example, doesn't have enough eigenvectors to span the full space. But if you can find an eigenbasis, it makes matrix operations really lovely. For those of you willing to work through a pretty neat puzzle to see what this looks like in action, and how it can be used to produce some surprising results, I'll leave up a prompt here on the screen. It takes a bit of work, but I think you'll enjoy it. The next and final video of this series is going to be on abstract vector spaces. See you then!